What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? Wyatt and Tony are back for another fishing seminar. We've been doing these for you guys, and you seem to really like these kind of long-form discussions on tackle and just tactics for different species. And we just did a seminar on redfish a couple of weeks back, but we're starting to see some changes in the water temperature and just the overall habits of these fish. And we wanted to kind of share some of those updates with you guys and really kind of dial in on what the best lures to use for these early summer redfish are going to be. So me and Tony are going to go through some of our favorite lures to be thrown right now, what we're seeing working, how we're going to use it, and the types of areas that we're seeing them most productive. So let's go ahead and start with uh, Tony. I know you said you've been getting on to some really nice redfish sight fishing up in the shallows. So sight fishing up in the shallows, what are you throwing at these reds when you're seeing them tailing, chasing around bait, all that stuff? What is your go-to bait for that kind of sight fishing scenario? So sight fishing, I used to primarily use jerk baits, jerk shads, especially in super clean water, because if you throw a paddle tail or something that has a lot of commotion at a redfish that is sort of just sitting still and knows what's going on around it, or that fish may be cruising the shoreline, I like to go with a jerk shad. So like the Alabama leprechaun works really well. But I would have to say in this case, my favorite for sight casting would have to be the gulp jerk shad. I like them in the camo color. I have my little bait wallet here. We actually sell these wallets on our shop page now, so you can check those out. Uh, but they work really well for holding gulp, holding the juice. They don't leak. But the reason I like to go with gulp is because it's a little bit of a thinner profile uh, than the Alabama leprechaun. And also it has that scent. I don't know what gulp uses in their scent, but redfish pick up on that really quickly. I can cast these things out next to a redfish and not even move it and they'll find it, especially if you're on tailing redfish because those redfish are so focused in the grass and the mud. They don't really know what's going on around them. They're feeling for, you know, something to move around or to pick up on the scent of something. So gulp shrimp, gulp jerk shad, that smaller, thinner profile works really well. And I'll rig them up on a 1 16th ounce owner twist lock hook. And the reason I do the 1 16th ounce with the jerk shads as opposed to like a paddle tail is because number one, I'm fishing really shallow. Also jerk shads have that uh, slimmer profile. So they glide down to the bottom much faster than a paddle tail would. So with a paddle tail, that's my next top choice. I go with a 1 8 ounce because on that fall, the tail, you have more resistance and it's going to slow down that fall. So you want to go with a little heavier of a weight just so you can get that bait down to the bottom where those fish are primarily feeding. Yeah, I would, I would say I have to agree. Those are probably my two top sight fishing lures as far as redfish go. You know, it's really interesting. You, you made that comment on the scent. It seems like as we get into the warmer and warmer months, and I do see this in the winter as well, when we kind of get to some extreme temperatures, when it's really hot or really cold, and the fish kind of lock down, their metabolism is stunted because of extreme heat or cold. And it seems like something that can really fire up that bite is that scent. Uh, so that's a really big key that I find as well, you know, as we're getting into some warmer months, if you do see lethargic fish or, you know, you're outside of a bite window, you're outside of that max current period, you hit them outside of the twilight zone. There's a lot of different factors that are going to influence how hot a bite can be, but that scent definitely, especially if a fish is already kind of keyed in on a lure and it's deciding whether it's going to hit it or not, that extra scent factor almost always gets them to commit. I find if you can get them to trap on a lure, um, I, I've 100% seen the difference there. Uh, and, you know, like you said, I'm going to use the Alabama leprechaun. I'm going to use the gulp jerk shads. I find if, you know, scent is a really, really key factor. If they're really locked down, I'm going to go ahead and throw that gulp jerk shad. But if there's a lot of pinfish around, there's, you know, a lot of little trash fish that are picking apart my lures, I'm going to be burning through gulp packs like nobody else's business. These are a little bit tougher um, and they are still pre-scented. So you've got, you know, both of those factors going for you. Uh, something that I found if they're just keyed in on a really good darting motion. I just started using these waiter Dave and me went out for a wade fishing trip for redfish. We're going to be having some videos that probably will already be published at the time of this, uh, at the time of this seminar, these worked really, really well. Uh, the little Johns, um, in the XL and just the regular profile, uh, we were using the watermelon red glitter as well as the golden brim. We've got these in our shop. Uh, they've got a really, really good darting action to them. Some of them are scented. Some of them aren't, I don't know why mirror lure chooses to do that. And why not just send them all? Um, but they've got a fantastic darting action to them. It's a little bit fatter, uh, and it's a little bit of a different action than you might be used to with the jerk shad. And the way that waiter Dave kind of walked me through how you want to retrieve them is it's not, 
with most jerk shads, we're doing kind of a, a diagonal pop, you know, twitch, twitch, pause. With these, it seems like the best action comes from a horizontal. Uh, it actually, the lure, just because it's got that blunt face and the kind of odd body, it darts in every different direction. Most of these you'll see, they'll dart up like this uh, and then settle back down. I don't know what it is about those little Johns. They're great. Um, but, you know, play around with different jerk sets, find what you're most comfortable working. Each one of them has got kind of a different, you know, profile to it and figuring out how that's going to flutter down, how you adjust your retrieve with that, figuring out what's comfortable is really what's going to be most important. But one thing I will say about jerk shads is if you've got a day where it's really choppy, really nasty, you know, or the water's murked up really hard, uh, unless that lure has a ton of scent, I find redfish don't key in on jerk shads as hard. Um, and that's really where that paddle tail comes in, as you mentioned earlier. You know, if I'm seeing redfish activity in the water, you know, wakes, boils, things like that, I'm seeing mud clouds, but the water is really you know, stained or dirty, or it's windy, rainy. Uh, we've had some 20 mile per hour, really rainy days. We've had to fish in recently, Tony. Um, and you know, that paddle tail can be absolutely deadly in that situation. Uh, being able to, to kind of know where those fish are, you can see something's happening over there and work different angles quickly with that paddle tail, find out where those fish are. Um, you know, it, it's a fantastic lure, you know, for sight fishing, but at the same time, uh, it's a great search bait as well. And I'd like to kind of lead into that kind of next category uh, as we're kind of looking for redfish. It's really tough to beat a paddle tail right now. Just a just a, a quick moving bait fish imitation. As we talked about, their foraging uh, is starting to change with this increasing water temperature. We really hammered home the uh, the spring bait fish uh, migration and spring bait fish hatch that just occurred uh, in the, these past couple of seminars that we've done. And now those fish are starting to increase in size. The small pinfish, the small mullet, little little bait fish that you know we see these redfish kind of keying in on a lot more. And that Gulf shrimp migration, all those shrimp that hatched up in the small, really shallow estuaries, marshes, shallow flats, things like that. That migration is kind of starting to tune down. And I'm seeing, you know, my shrimp lures are starting to kind of tone down a little bit um, in terms of productivity. That's not to say I'm not catching fish on them still, but, you know, I find more redfish are keying in on bait fish profiles and quick moving, you know, the jerk shad, I'm not working it like it's a shrimp. The beauty of a jerk shad is you can work it fast to imitate a bait fish and you can work it slow to imitate a shrimp double twitch pause for shrimp you know maybe three twitches let it settle for that bait fish imitation i'm really seeing that that redfish are keying in on on bait fish imitations more spoons you know top waters we're going to cover soon uh you know the paddle tails are you seeing the same thing over in your area i know i'm over here in texas you're over in the east coast of florida are you seeing that redfish are keying in more on paddle tails and you know those bait fish imitations or are they still sticking to kind of shrimp profiles um, it's a little bit of everything because, you know, in the estuaries over here, Mosquito Lagoon, Banana River, Indian River, we have shrimp pretty much year round. You know, they they come in really thick certain times of the year. And then as it starts getting warmer, I, I start seeing a lot more shrimp in the backwater areas, you know, those muddy areas. And you'll find redfish pushed up in like five, six inches of water chasing shrimp. So I don't, you know, I don't put the shrimp lure away. Uh, in the summertime, I'll definitely have one rigged up, but you're usually going to find the smaller shrimp in the summertime. So I'll go with the Power Prawn Junior, which is our smaller uh, version of the Power Prawn. And then in the fall and then the, in the winter, I switched that bigger uh, profile Power Prawn shrimp lure. But um, as far as, you know, just trying to keep it simple, can't really go wrong with a jerk shad because it imitates both. You know, you have that shrimp darting action. Then you also have the bait fish action, which can be very similar. Yeah, no, they're phenomenal. And what size paddle tail are you going with? You know, I'm starting to see my, my three and a half inches I've found best, uh, for, you know, the spring, but I'm starting to see those redfish keying in on kind of larger lures. They're willing to hit them where, you know, I'm, the, the bomber was not working. It's not what I would have been throwing, uh, you know, two months ago, but I've started to catch more and more redfish on it. And, and, you know, I was in a tournament this past weekend and I caught one of my tournament fish on that bomber looking for those larger reds that were keyed in on, you know, some of these big mullet schools. It seems like they might be starting to attack some of these mullet that they've been cruising around with looking for some of the, the smaller bait fish that they're kind of stirring up. 
one of the big things we've hammered home recently is look for those bait fish schools, those big mullet schools. And the redfish weren't necessarily attacking those mullet. What they were doing was kind of following them around, letting the mullet stir up the sand and the mud and all the grass and let those shrimp kind of flee out away from them. Uh, and then the redfish were picking off all those smaller, you know, prey items that were kind of scooting away from the mullet. But it seems like, and, and I, I'm, this is just a theory right now because I haven't seen it yet, but it seems like they might be starting to kind of key in on some of those mullet as the smaller, you know, bait and forage isn't as present. Uh, you know, they're, they're falling around those mullet schools and now they're starting to kind of become prey. Uh, but big thing is, you know, find that, that, find that mullet school that's, you know, a hundred mullet thick uh, and those redfish will be around there. And you'll a lot of times find trout close by too, but it seems like they are starting to key in on some of those larger, you know, bait fish presentations. Are you still using kind of smaller paddle tails? Or are you starting to kind of transition up? Yeah, I, I try to keep it pretty consistent all year long with a three and a half inch paddle tail. You really can't beat it all year long. And what's really going to make me start using a bigger bait is when the water starts getting dirtier, uh, just because a bigger profile, bigger paddle, it's going to cause more of a disturbance in the water. And it just helps those fish key in on that lure. But if you're throwing, you know, a, a five, six inch bait and in super clean water for redfish, those redfish are going to take off. They don't want nothing to do with that. <laughs> so if the water's really clear, I'll stick to that three and a half inch. Even if it's dirty, sometimes I'll stick to that three and a half inch. But the only time I'll really go bigger uh, early summer is if the water is really dirty. Yeah, no, and I, I do want to clarify that that red that I caught this past weekend, it was in a torrential downpour with 20 mile per hour winds. That water was as dirty as it could be. Uh, dirtiest I've seen it, at least in the past like two months for the area that I've been fishing. Um, but yeah, definitely not throwing that big bomber in super clear water. Usually when it's super clear, I'm going to go with one of those, with one of those jerk shads or one of my small paddle tails. It's a little bit more of a delicate presentation. Something with redfish I see is you don't want to overdo it, but at the same time you want to get their attention. It's su subtlety is the name of the game with redfish subtle enough to get noticed, uh, but not enough to be loud, I guess I would say. So, uh, and I guess we're about to break that rule with the next lure we're going to talk about, which is, uh, I'm so glad that this time of the year is here and it's top water. Uh, I started throwing them kind of as we get, we got towards the tail end of spring, mainly for trout. Um, but I'm starting to get a lot of redfish crushing them. And this is kind of factoring into my theory with, they're starting to kind of attack those mullet schools. Um, something that is really interesting. And I, I was taking some folks out that weren't too familiar with walking the dog and it was kind of a little bit difficult and too late to kind of teach it when I realized the topwater bite was on was these weight baits. Uh, you can pick these up. They're pretty cheap. It's basically a, a crankbait uh, and you work it the same way. It's just a simple retrieve, uh, pretty slow. You can mix some pauses in, but the bill is situated to where this thing rides along the top of the water column. Uh, so if you don't know how to walk the dog or you're not comfortable doing it um, and you're still wanting to get on that top water bite or you're taking someone out that doesn't know how to do it, you can absolutely catch redfish with these weight baits. This is one by six fence, I believe. Um, but I do find that the walk the dog style baits are way more effective. Those are a great option for someone that doesn't know how to, you know, walk the dog or just wants to get on a top water bite without having to, you know, work their wrist a lot. Um, but if you really want the most strikes, I find that the walk the dog spooks, uh, this is a head and one knocker. My super spook juniors have been producing really well, but I'm starting to get larger redfish that are interested in larger bait fish presentations. So I'm up in the ante with a lot of my top waters. I'm throwing full size skitter walks. I'm throwing my skitter V's, you know, some larger top waters to, to kind of get the attention of some of those larger fish fish. So I, I'm seeing, you know, larger topwaters working. Uh, in fact, I actually had a redfish come up and crack one of my super spooks. Um, he hit it so hard, it cracked the front of it. And I had to trash that spook uh, because it was filling up with water. But, you know, this warm water has these fish super energized uh, and they're willing to come up and crush these lures. But I'm using these early in the morning, you know, right as the sun's coming up. I'm not throwing these mid morning. I'm not throwing these, you know, in the afternoon really only around twilight periods when the bite's really hot, these fish are fired up uh, and I want to get on some of those larger quality fish that, you know, are willing to feed at that time. You know, in the winter time, you, you may be able to get some fish uh, like trout that'll hit, you know, later on in the day on top water. But I find that right now, maybe as we get later on to the summer, you, that bite period may be extended, but it's really only in the early morning that I'm throwing top waters. Have you seen anything as far as the top water game goes down in your area uh, with redfish? Yeah, so, so topwaters and redfish, for me, 
I mean, I could probably count on my hand how many redfish I've caught on top water. It just doesn't seem to be that productive for me uh, personally, unless I know the bite is like those fish are being super aggressive. Usually if I'm tying on top water, I'm going after trout or snook just because they're more prone to strike at the surface. Redfish, just because of their anatomy, their mouth, it's really tough for them to strike top water unless again, like, like I said, they're being super aggressive. I don't know if you've gotten, you know, your redfish on top water, was it in deep water or was it pretty shallow where those fish are pretty much eye level with that bait as opposed to being up underneath it? Yeah. So the areas I've been throwing top water, you know, these are channel edges where they meet flats. So it's kind of a small mix. I would say somewhere between that two and five foot range. Um, you know, I'm not throwing these in super, super, super shallow water. I'm going to reserve that kind of area for my jerk shads, um, my, my paddle tails that are rigged up on those 16 ounce owner twist locks. Um, but what I'm doing, and I'm, again, I'm not throwing these, uh, in times where I could throw a subsurface lure, I'm throwing these when it's still dark outside or the sun is just coming up. And I know that subsurface would not be as productive um, just because those fish would have a little bit of a difficult time seeing. If I am going to throw a subsurface before the morning, uh, before that morning light comes, I'm going to throw a paddle tail that's got some good vibration with it. I'm likely not going to gravitate towards a jerk shad uh, just because I need a little bit more presence in the water because it still is dark. Uh, but the only reason I'm throwing those top waters is because because uh, that sound, that vibration, that frequency from those rattles and the splashing up top tells those redfish where there's a bait. If I know that the bite is going to be hot, you know, if we've got a good day where there's a changing uh, barometer, uh, a really good changing barometer, either moving from low to high or high to low, it doesn't matter. Uh, or I'm fishing, you know, a, a day where the, the temperatures are a little bit more optimal. You know, it's not been super hot or it's not been super cold. I'm going to save those top waters for the days that I feel that the bite is hot. And a, lot, a good way to know this is, you know, just go on uh, our smart fishing tides and you'll get a score for that day on higher score days. Usually I'm going to throw a top water because the conditions are a little bit more optimal for it. Um, but again, as you said, it's, it's a not, it's not a high percentage bait, but it's one of those baits that you can get some really fun, you know, experiences with uh, redfish are not anatomy wise suited to hit top waters. But it is very fun. And, it, you know, in the early morning when I know that subsurface would not be the most productive, uh, I am going to throw those top waters just because it, it just extends the amount of time that I have to fish. Um, I would say that, you know, before that light is up, it is easier to catch them on top water than it is subsurface. But that moment that that light comes up, you should definitely be throwing subsurface if you want to catch the most fish possible. You know, I would say it's probably a one to five ratio uh, of fish that you would catch subsurface to top water or five to one in that, in that order. Uh, so definitely keep the top water in the box, but save it for the days where the bite's going to be hot and you're fishing kind of early morning before that sun's up. Cause that's when you're going to have the best chance of success, but don't throw it during the middle of the day for sure. Yeah. I was going to say too, something I noticed, just thought about this. I was thinking about the redfish that I've caught on top water and it has been in the summertime. And it's usually after a day, we get a lot of rainfall because the surface temperature it helps drop that surface temperature of the water. So if you have, you know, summertime, we get down here in Florida, we get a lot of those afternoon thunderstorms that roll through. And then the next morning, I'll throw top water and I usually have really good success with it for redfish. And um, also another thing I wanted to point out, most of the reds that I've caught and landed on top water, I use inline hooks. For some reason I've had more fish either break, like you said, they've cracked your Rapala. I've had them break off barbs on treble hooks, bend the barbs just because they're strong fighters and they've got really tough mouths. And those inline hooks definitely help up, help with the hookup ratio on redfish. Oh, I 100% agree. The only reason you're seeing treble hooks on some of these, these top waters is because I'm burning through top waters like nobody's business. And I've not had the chance to change some of these over to inlines, but I've yeah, got them on here. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, it, it makes a, a world of difference. You definitely, number one, don't lose as many fish. Uh, redfish, something to keep in mind. Keep working that top water after you get that strike. I would say one out of 10 fish nails it on the first strike. Usually they'll come back a second time. With trout, they'll follow it all the way back up to the boat. They'll hit it five, six times. Redfish usually give you two to three. I would say no more than that. 
Um, and it's usually right along the shoreline. So it's like, if you're making a cast to an area uh, and you're working it out from that shoreline, 15 feet max, and then just burn it back to the boat, get another one out. It's more important to be efficient with those casts, uh, but you know, you get that blow up and you keep working it, keep working it a little bit faster because those reds, they come up, they're either going to roll on it or they're going to surge on it. So you're going to see them, they're going to come up and they're going to do almost a barrel roll and swipe it sideways. Uh, or they're going to like literally get up behind it. You're going to see their back come up out of the water. That's my favorite eat because you're going to see the whole fish right before it hits your lure. Um, but they're again, their jaw hinges downward. So they're usually going to miss it the first time. And then they're going to cut a different angle on it. So you need to work that bait fast. Do not stop it because what that fish is doing, it knows that bait's still running and it's picking up missed ground as it moves to cut that second angle. So you need to keep working that bait and have it in front of that fish again for the second strike. If you stop it, that fish is going to continue forward past the plug and then it's going to be looking around wondering where that top water is and it's not there. So you got to keep working that bait. You know, it's going to come hit two to three times. Usually I'll get that hook up on the second. The second, usually that, that angle that they cut, they're there, they're ready for it and, and they're, uh, they're going to smash it. But you are going to miss a lot of fish. Uh, again, you're going to maybe catch two out of the five fish that, that are striking at it. Um, but it's just that top water explosion, phenomenal. And you usually get very good quality. You're not going to have a lot of rat red fish hitting that top water. It's usually going to be your big slots, your upper slots, um, even, you know, some, some upper thirties. I've had some really big red fish hitting top water recently. Um, so it's just one of those baits that's really fun to use. And now's the time to definitely start throwing them uh, for sure. Start throwing those top water plugs. Yep. First thing in the morning and twilight, you know, right before the sun goes down, that's going to be, be the best bet for those. Yeah. And, and you know, it, as you guys are kind of seeing the trend with most of these baits is that they are starting to be a little bit more fast moving. They're starting to be presentations where you're going to be working these baits, you know, constantly, or you're trying to imitate something that has a lot of energy to it. Uh, you're switching up from some of these suspending twitch baits, from some of these static baits that we showed earlier on in some of these seminars, just because the water temperatures are rising. Something to keep in mind with any game fish is that it's cold blooded and it's going to react to its environment. So as those temperatures rise, their metabolism gets going more and they need to eat to keep up with that burning metabolism. So if they're not eating constantly, their body is literally, you know, eating itself and consuming calories from the fat stores that it's, it's gotten from prior meals. And then eventually when those fat stores run out, it's very unhealthy for the fish. You might see some fish that have parasites that are weak, that didn't fight very hard. You know, those are fish that are suffering from fighting against, you know, different elements and temperature changes and not having food sources. But, you know, most of these fish, they're keyed in with what's going on with the temperature and they're going to adjust their feeding habits to these rising temperatures. So you're going to see a lot more. I've, I'll tell you what, I've never had redfish fight as hard as I have these past couple of weeks with this, uh, this rise in temperature. It just seems like they have so much more energy. I put my hands on these fish to release them. And they're hot. Feels like they've been sitting in, in really warm water. It's pretty crazy, but I, I definitely see a lot more energy in these fish. Uh, they're one inch chase down fast moving lures. So, you know, my retrieves with, you know, for say a paddle tail, which is going to be my number one bait for redfish. I will definitely say if I'm trying to find them, if I'm sight fishing at them, if I want to get a redfish to strike, I'm throwing this. Uh, and what I'm doing is just a four count constant retrieve. One, two, three, four at that speed. And then I'm going to give it a one, two drop. So one, two, that way. And I'm going to have some awesome drone footage for you guys to kind of show you how redfish track on these lures. Uh, and then they'll pick them up on the drop. But what I've been seeing is that these fish, they're following it for that four count. You're basically using that four count not to catch the fish, but to cover ground. And then that two count drop and always, if you can try to drop it over a pothole or a depth change or something where redfish might be sitting in. Uh, Cause once that lure goes down, that's a chance for any fish that's number one, sitting under it to strike number two, uh, any fish that we're tracking on it to leap on it. Uh, and it's almost always on that stop, you know, that one, two drop. Cause I'm usually fishing in very shallow water with say an eighth ounce or a 16 ounce jig head. And that gives that time, uh, that bait time to flutter down. Um, obviously in a little bit deeper water, I'm going to use the eighth. And when I say deeper, I mean like three to four feet uh, in the, you know, shallowest of water uh, in that one to two foot range. I'm using those 16th ounce. I'm using the exact same, same cadence, that four to two. Um, but it's just adjusting the weight of my jigs or my weighted hooks so that that fall places it almost right at the bottom, but not sitting on the bottom. Uh, so I can pick up my retrieve because you really need to be thinking about covering ground. 
You're using that four count to move through areas to get the attention of fish and that two counts where you're going to get your strike. And I see a lot of people rush a pause. They'll stop for half a second and then they count that as a pause. That drop is what triggers that strike. So you need to give just as much effort to the pause as you do the constant retrieve. So covering ground with a four count, stopping with two. And then you do that several times, working different angles with redfish. Name of the game is cover ground till you find the fish. And then once you find them, keep working different angles. Redfish are not very picky. In fact, I would say they're, uh, other than flounder, they're the least picky fish out there. Uh, so it's very hard to, to get them to not commit to lures unless they're in that lethargic state that we talked about earlier. So just a constant retrieve, covering ground, again, mixing in pauses so you can attract the strikes is what's going to get you on the most fish. The fisherman that puts the lure in front of the most fish's face is going to catch the most fish, even if you're passing up some fish. You just keep covering ground, burning those retrieves, and again, mixing in some pauses so that you can get those strikes, but you're going to find you catch a lot more fish doing that. Again, that's why I love paddle tails. Uh, it's just a great bait profile this time of year, uh, and it just allows you to cover areas so efficiently. Um, when you're searching for reds, you know, what lure are you going to be using? Is it going to be the jerk shot? Is it going to be the paddle tail? What's your go-to? I need to find and catch some redfish lure, Tony. Yeah, if I'm searching, it's definitely going to be that paddle tail. So I was going to say, if I'm rigging up two rods to fish for redfish specifically, it's going to be a jerk shad. It's going to be a paddle tail. Paddle tail is going to be the first thing I throw once I find those reds. And let's say if they're not hitting the paddle tail, if they're just chasing it and short striking it or you know, they're following it, then turning away. I'll switch to something a little bit smaller and or not smaller, but more of a finesse presentation like a jerk shad and have some scent scent on there, whether it's a scent you put on or the gulp products, you know, that already have that scent on there. And I wanted to emphasize something you mentioned about casting, you know, as opposed to trout and let's say snook, those types of species usually are sitting in one place. With redfish, I find that they're more of a cruising species you know they school up they're constantly swimming around or even if they're not schooled up they're cruising a shoreline they're constantly on the move so you cast to one spot that fish may not be there yet you could make a second or third cast and all of a sudden that redfish is there so you you definitely have to make a lot of casts when fishing or for redfish um like when you're fishing to a specific type of structure let's say you're casting to a point don't just make one cast to that point, make multiple casts to that point, because that fish may be just coming around the corner of that point, you know, swimming around, or it may be swimming back and forth on that point, looking for something to come by. So definitely make multiple casts to whatever area you're fishing. Fan cast, if you're fishing an open flat, cast to a pothole, cast right down the middle, cast to the edge of it, make multiple casts. Oh yeah. And, and uh, Justin said this in a recent podcast, he, he just called the meanders or they're meandering around the best word for redfish out there is they meander and I, I, fishing recently, you know, you can see these schools and they don't, they don't sit in one spot. They're going to run different shorelines, which is why it's important not to get locked down on one spot and continue fishing around. Cause I literally, you know, we track the school and moving with the trolling motor uh, you know, you're covering a whole almost half mile stretch with this school and then they flip around and they run that shoreline again. And it's just, you need to be there when they're feeding. Number one, you know, find that right tide window. Uh, we teach about all this stuff in the salt strong insider club. We can cover that a little bit later, but find that right kind of bite window when they're going to be feeding and continue to search for them until you find them. Try not to spook that school because they are schooled up right now. Uh, and, and they will stay schooled up for another, you know, month or two, maybe more, uh, but they're going to start breaking apart into smaller schools. Uh, but right now they're schooled up and you don't want to blow those fish out, which is again, why waiting can be really, really good. It's really, you know, quiet. I've seen fish swimming right next to me. Uh, they don't care that you're, there's not a big presence in the water as long as you're not moving around, not making a ton of splashing. If you don't move at all, you know, if you're sitting there locked up, completely frozen, I've had them swim right by my waist. They don't know you're there. They don't care uh, if, you're, if you're not moving around. So waiting can be a really, if you know where the fish are, waiting can be absolutely killer. Um, if you have a general idea of where the presence of fish are uh, and you don't want to spook them off, I like the kayak, but if you're just searching for fish and you have access to a boat, nothing beats getting on the trolling motor and burning shorelines, throwing paddle tails. Uh, just covering those shorelines uh, it is so critical, making a lot of casts, like Tony said, uh, and finding where those fish are meandering around. Because you'll hit them, uh, and then you need to kind of flip around and continue to follow them. Most times when you spook off fish, they're not going to go very far. It's not like a trout uh, that shoots off half a mile when you scare it off. 
Those reds, you scare them off. They're going to shoot probably 25 yards and you can go catch them 10 minutes later. Cause they just, they've got the memory of a goldfish. They forgot you were even there. Um, but, but yeah, just burning those shorelines, finding those fish really critical this time of year. Cause they've got a lot of energy. They're out there searching around, trying to find an easy meal. Uh, and you just got to give it to them. For sure. All right. I think we pretty much covered all the lures for them. Yeah, I think uh, I think we did. And something that's really important to remember, guys, we talked about a lot of different lures here. We're not sponsored by anybody. I'm pretty sure we gave like four or five different types of jerk shad brands you could go with. But I would say don't get too caught up in the lures. As, as we covered in the retrieve section of this seminar, you really just need to be in the right spot, know the right time that these fish are going to be feeding. Uh, and, and that's not knowledge that you're just going to, you're going to learn through trial and error. It's actually science-based stuff that we do teach in the Salt Strong Insider Club. We have a full mastery course uh, just over how to read satellite maps, which is really, really important to know where the general locales, because a redfish is a redfish from Texas to Florida to North Carolina. I use a lot of the same tactics that I used in the Carolinas here in Texas, just from scouting satellite maps to know where fish are. I can look at a spot in Florida uh, and tell you where redfish are kind of be kind of sitting around the general location, um, just because these fish, they behave biologically the same. Uh, and you just need to know what to look for. And then once you learn how to read tide tables, you learn how to, you know, understand where fish are going to be at certain parts of that tide under different conditions. There's certain trends you got to kind of keep up with. All this is stuff that we share in the Salt Strong Insider Club. And if you really want to step up your game, it's not going to be from buying a new box of tackle, filling it with top water plugs or soft plastics or, you know, whatever it may be, what is latest and greatest on the market. It's going to be learning how to find these fish at the right time in the right spots. That's what's going to put you on the most fish because we've actually had insiders throw, what was it, two by four chunks with treble hooks. Austin Campbell, shout out to him, catching redfish on literally pieces of wood with treble hooks. These fish are not super picky. It's a more about finding the right spots, being there at the right time. And that's what we teach you in the Salt Strong Insider Club. So if you guys are looking to step up your red fishing game and you already have some of these lures, which I can guarantee if you're listening to this, you're probably a tackle head like me, you already have them go join us in the Salt Strong Insider Club. It's really going to help you step up your game where me and Tony share on the water reports weekly, spot dissections. We even dissect areas that members request. So if you don't know what to look for, join the Insider Club and ask us a question. We might put it up as our spot dissection next week. Uh, we do them every single week, me and Tony. Um, we can really help you guys step up your fishing game if you want to take the time to learn how to do things properly. Yep, not to mention the uh, inner circle we now do weekly. You know, every Thursday we do a live Q and A with any and all members that want to show up, and you know, basically talk directly to us, ask us questions live on a Zoom call. So any questions you have, we can answer them right there. Then we have the community where everybody can ask their questions. It's a friendly group of people. You know, it's not like Facebook, and there's no snow candy, there's no bashing, there's none of that bad stuff. We control it. So if you're looking for helpful information and make new friends, you know, that's a big part of the fishing community is, you know, being able to be able to talk to people, you know, share, share ideas, share what's working, share, you know, Hey, I haven't been able to go out in two weeks where the fish are biting and, you know, we'll actually help you out with that. Yeah, no, I mean, being able to keep up with trends and know what's happening in areas, you know, whether you're being, you're able to get on the water or not super, super important. Uh, and that's what the community is for, to be able to connect with like-minded anglers, to ask questions to people that are having success if you want to become more successful, uh, but just to also keep up with what's going on. I can know what's going on in the northern parts of Texas just as much as I can right there uh, down in Brownsville or Port Mansfield. Uh, and obviously I get to share everything that's going on here in Corpus. And I love providing this information for you guys because I really get to see, you know, and I'm sure Tony's seen it in the Mosquito Lagoon area as well. Being able to provide those trends really helps people that are maybe only able to get out on the water once a weekend, um, you know, once a month, twice a month, really helps keep those people in tune with what's going on. And, and you know, being able to see People have success, gives us happiness, uh, and it just makes us want to share more with you guys. So if you have any other questions, I know we covered a lot in this podcast. If there's anything that you guys want us to make further tutorial videos on, um, anything like that, please leave it in the comment section below. And if there's any you know topics you'd like us to cover for this next little tea time with Tony and Wyatt, leave it in the comment section and we'll be sure to cover it. So guys, thank you again so much for watching. And we're looking forward to seeing you in the Salt Strong Insider community. Thank you guys. See you again soon.
So if you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the best online fishing club in America because we literally guarantee that you'll be catching more fish in less time while saving money on your tackle. We do this by providing you with premium education, an exclusive online fishing community, and access to group discounts on the best saltwater fishing tackle. To learn more, go to saltstrong.com. We hope to see you in the Insider Club family soon.